The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of Oshkosh Media, the City of Oshkosh, or your video service provider. Robert Girardi, uh, Chicago uh, lifelong resident of the city of Chicago. I'm a Civil War author, historian, and speaker. Tonight I'm speaking at the Milwaukee Civil War Roundtable in the beautiful, historic Wisconsin Club, the home of uh, General Billy Mitchell's family. And I'm going to be speaking on President Abraham Lincoln and the Common Soldier. Uh, that's for later. I'm also going to be uh, pr promoing, if you will, uh, my latest book, uh, the Civil War generals, comrades, peers, rivals in their own words. And what this is, is a compilation of quotations by and about Civil War generals on both sides uh, about their peers. So the good stuff, the bad stuff, and the dirty little secrets, it's all here in one book. I deal with more than 400 generals, uh, and so it's a very uh, fun read. It's also one-stop shopping if you're looking to find out something quick about your favorite Civil War general. Uh, I love history, I love the Civil War, and I hope you enjoy my presentation and my book, which is available in fine bookstores everywhere. So, thank you. Thank you. It fits. Thank you for having me back. Uh, we're all infected by the history virus and the Civil War flu. Thank you for coming out. It's a treat for me. Most of my programs this year have been canceled. This is only the fourth talk I'm doing this year, and I'm glad to be doing it live. And no, I will not put the mask over my face. <laughs> you have to look at me the whole time. I did this program uh, originally for a Sons of Union Veterans event earlier this year, actually the last program I gave, and I thought maybe that was the reason. But you're going to be subjected to it tonight, Abraham Lincoln and the Common Soldier. Abraham Lincoln, when we think of him, in this room anyway, is the great American. One thinks of him as his larger-than-life image. Self-made man, successful lawyer and politician, uh, good family man, and steward of the, the Union through the ordeal of the Civil War. He was the great emancipator and ultimately the martyr on the altar of freedom. He is not usually thought of as a great military commander or commander-in-chief. And yet it is in that capacity that he became known to his armies, the millions of men who served for him, as Father Abraham, a title unthinkable for our political leadership in this day and age. Lincoln's genuine concern for and empathy for the common soldier helped to elevate him to this status. The President of the United States is also the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, with sole responsibility for deciding how and where to utilize them in the time of war. He bears the burden of sending these men to their deaths, potentially. It is a somber burden, and it must not be treated cavalierly. Abraham Lincoln took this responsibility to heart. As a nation founded by a war for freedom and reinvigorated in a war for liberation and unity, we have had several presidents who were also great military leaders. 
George Washington, the father of the country, held a ragtag army together in an unprecedented series of defeats, finally wearing down the enemy through sheer determination and force of will. His victory allowed for the creation of the United States, and it was his leadership that was crucial in bringing the new government to life. Andrew Jackson won fame fighting the Creek Indians and defeating the British in the Battle of New Orleans at the end of the War of 1812. Again, overcoming improbable odds and became president based largely on that fame. William Henry Harrison rode into the White House on the fame of his victory at the Battle of Tippecanoe. Zachary Taylor, old rough and ready as he was known, won fame on the plains of Mexico. He rode that fame into the White House, as did one of his acolytes in that war, Ulysses S. Grant, who led the Union armies to victory during the Civil War. Theodore Roosevelt led his Rough Riders up San Juan Hill all the way into the White House. And Dwight Eisenhower, who was the Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Forces in Europe, led the last campaign against Nazi Germany and shortly afterwards became president. Until recently, it was unthinkable that one could be elected president of the United States without having some semblance of military service in their background. Except for Washington, none of the men that we looked at uh, was universally revered. The only president who comes close to that reverence was Abraham Lincoln. We do not usually think of Lincoln as a military leader, but that is in fact what he became. Lincoln took over the position and responsibility of commander-in-chief with virtually no practical military experience except a brief stint during the Black Hawk War. In 1832, he served for several months in Company A of the 31st Illinois Militia by mosquitoes. But during this time, Lincoln learned much about the mindset of the citizen soldier, their expectations and gripes, and their sense of duty and its limitations. After his one month service as captain, he re-enlisted for two additional months as a private. His men idolized him, remembered Henry Green. All the men in the company, as well as the regiment to which he and they belonged, loved him well. Almost worshipped him, wrote Henry McHenry. Lincoln had the reputation for being able to get a fo rough force of men to bend to his will. After his service, Lincoln entered public life, serving in the Illinois State House and in the U.S. Congress for one term. During his term in Congress, Lincoln was an outspoken critic of the Mexican War because he viewed it as a pretext to amass new territories into which slavery would spread. Despite his anti-war stance, he voted for all measures that dealt with paying, and paying for and appropriating necessary supplies for the volunteer soldiers fighting in the war. He was against the war, but he backed the boys who were fighting. Lincoln went on to become a successful lawyer, but the controversies over slavery drew him back into politics. Although he lost the senatorial election in Illinois in 1858, he catapulted himself onto the national stage and was able to win not only the Republican nomination for the 1860 election, but the election as well. That victory divided the nation. On March 4, 1861, Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated to lead a divided country. Seven states had already left the Union. His entry into the nation's capital was under a cloud of a threat of assassination. In fact, four Army officers accompanied him on the train ride from Springfield to Washington. Upon his arrival in Washington, he quickly had to deal with threats from a hostile South and a divided North. And for the first time in our history, snipers and armed soldiers protected the man on the day of his inauguration. In the wake of the surrender of Fort Sumter, when Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers to put down the rebellion, he lost four additional states to the Southern Confederacy. With the loyalty of the border states, Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri undetermined, Washington, D.C. was surrounded by real and potential enemies. Fifty ragtag volunteers guarded the White House beginning on April 18th. They were armed with new muskets 
and drilled and slept in the White House. One man wrote that he and others slept sweetly on the president's rich Brussels carpet with their muskets stacked in the hallways. In the earliest days of the war, the president was rightfully aware that the very existence of the government relied on the proximity of troops to hold the capital. On April 19th, riots broke out in Baltimore when Massachusetts volunteers marched across town to board the train for Washington. Four members of the 6th Massachusetts militia were killed and several dozen injured. Twelve civilians were also killed in the mayhem. In Washington, D.C., many of the local militia forces refused to take the oath of loyalty to the United States and instead enlisted in Confederate regiments in Virginia. Seventy-five veterans of the War of 1812 volunteered to guard the president until relief arrived. Anxiously awaiting sufficient forces to protect Washington, President Lincoln would climb atop the roof of the White House and using a telescope scan the horizon for signs of either friendly forces marching to the relief of Washington or Confederate forces marching against it. No other American president in our history has ever had to live in such danger and uncertainty with so much at stake. It is no wonder that Lincoln would feel a special connection to members of the military when he knew that everything that mattered, his life, his family, and his country, depended on their presence and their willingness to protect and defend. When the 7th New York Infantry and the 6th Massachusetts marched down Pennsylvania Avenue, they were received as saviors of the city. That sense of security and relief which this brought cannot be understood unless one has been in life-threatening danger. Lincoln shook the hand of every man that he could, saying to their commanders, thank God you have come, for if you had not, Washington would have been in the hands of the rebels before morning. Your brave boys have saved the capital. There would not be a single day in Lincoln's presidency when he was not living amongst soldiers. These included the guards at the White House, his escort bodyguards, whom he often tried to elude, the soldiers he lived with and near at his refuge, the soldier's home, a few miles from the White House, and the constant stream of visitors with dispatches or requests in the armies of thousands whenever he reviewed troops or visited them in the field. The welfare of these men was always in his mind. He routinely tipped his hat to soldiers even before they recognized or saluted him. And he usually bowed to honor troops passing him on the reviewing stand. Lincoln was always cognizant of the troops around him and from which states they hailed. In the early days of the war, the first troops from the western states to reach Washington were the 1st Michigan Infantry. Lincoln exclaimed, thank God for Michigan. During this period, it was not uncommon for him to invite soldiers to the White House. Come see my house, he told some soldiers one day. Excuse me, your house, one that I occupy for a while. Soon after their arrival in Washington, Julian Axtell and other soldiers in the 1st Michigan observed Mary Lincoln and her sons entering the White House. A servant who, who learned the regiment was from Michigan alerted President Lincoln. Here are two boys of the Michigan first who wish to see you. According to Axtell, the president jumped up like a cat and came across the room to meet us, shook hands heartily, and told us to sit down and make ourselves at home. Upon making some excuses for intruding, he shut us up with, it's all right, all right, I am glad you came. Then he asked us a great many questions about our regiment and expressed himself very much pleased to think we were back again. In August of 1861, Henry Watrous of the 6th Wisconsin and his brother Jerome of the 4th Wisconsin secured passes and entered the White House. According to Jerome, they were watching other soldiers marching when they were approached by President Lincoln. My boys, I see by your uniforms that you have come to help me save the Union, to be my partners in this enterprise. The President chatted with them for several minutes and thanked them. To have looked into Lincoln's face at close range, heard the Lincoln voice, had our hands enclosed in the ample Lincoln hand, 
was glory enough for more than one August day. In December 1862, Thomas Presnell of the First Minnesota, after taking offense, from a, taking offense from a White House guard, walked into the White House to meet Lincoln. According to Presnell, Lincoln met him inside, extended his hand, and said, Here I am, my man. What can I do for you? The flustered Presnell responded, Nothing in particular, only that I was on my way to my regiment at the front, and I would like to be able to tell the boys that I had the pleasure of shaking hands with Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln responded, well, you can do that now. Most of the soldiers Lincoln met with were from the eastern states. He was seldom able to meet with soldiers from the western theater, but he was nevertheless always aware uh, of their concerns and found a way to share with them the same rapport, even from afar. After the Battle of Fort Donelson in February of 1862, he remarked, I cannot speak so confidently about the fighting qualities of the Eastern men, or what are called Yankees, not knowing myself particularly to whom that appellation applies. But this I do know. If the Southerners think that man for man they are better than our Illinois men, or Western men generally, they will discover themselves in a grievous mistake. Comments like this endeared him to many soldiers. When the 8th Illinois Cavalry came to Washington, they passed in review for the president, who fondly referred to them as his big abolition regiment. Lincoln had a fond... Company C of the 8th Wisconsin Infantry named their mascot Old Abe, according to legend, because he resembled the president. Now, it is not known if Lincoln was aware of Old Abe and his many battlefield exploits, but he would no doubt have been very pleased if he did. In the spring of 1862, John Andrews and a number of volunteers from Ohio Infantry Regiments uh, went to capture a train to burn down the railroad bridges and tunnels of the Western and Atlantic Railroad. They were captured after the great locomotive chase. Uh, some of them escaped, and some of them, 11, were executed. As far as the escapees went, they became the first recipients of what today we call the Congressional Medal of Honor, back then the Medal of Honor. The survivors were invited, after receiving their medals, to come have an audience with Abraham Lincoln in the White House. He engaged them in conversation and asked them about their exploits in detail. To each man, he would come up and say, what did you do and what happened next? And he would actually, he was engaging them and interested in the entire escapade. One of these, uh, one observer of this meeting remembered, quote, Mr. Lincoln's manner toward enlisted men with whom he met and talked was always delightful in its bon homme and in its absolute freedom from anything like condescension. Lincoln made frequent visits to the many army camps surrounding the Capitol. He visited the Army of the Potomac at Harrison's Landing in 1862 to meet with General McClellan, but also to gauge the thinking of the army in the wake of its failed campaign to take Richmond. One soldier wrote, Old Abe was here. He is the soldier's friend and, above, and a man above all men in the right place. He has done what not one in 10,000 in a similar position would have brains enough to think of doing. That is, to take nobody's word or reports got up for effect. He came and saw for himself. Talk of McClellan's popularity of the soldiers? It will never measure one hundredth part of honest Abe's. Such cheers as greeted him never tickled the ears of Napoleon in his palmiest days. After the Battle of Second Bull Run, when the army retreated back through the streets of Washington, the Iron Brigade, I think they're from around here somewhere, paused for a rest near the White House, near the lawn. President Lincoln emerged carrying a pail of water and a dipper with which he offered a drink of water to the weary soldiers. In April of 1863, Private William Mason of the 12th New Hampshire Infantry recalled a visit Lincoln made to his regiment stationed at Falmouth, Virginia. 
The president has been here to review us, and he gave us his sincere thanks for neatness and good behavior. He is a thin, spare man with black eyes, black beard, and black hair mixed with gray. He is a very sober man and carried an expression of deep sadness upon his face and looks pale. I believe it will be means of his death. He is to be pitied. These examples demonstrate that Lincoln's involvement and interest in the soldiers was not just occasional or in today's terms a politically motivated photo opportunity. One can only imagine how important it was for him to communicate how much he respected the soldiers who were sacrificing so much to save the Union. The examples also show how important it was to the soldiers to interact with the president and how they were becoming concerned for his well-being. Lincoln never underestimated the sacrifice and service of the men he had called forth to fight for the nation. In 1863, in a letter that he wrote to New York Mayor George Updike, Lincoln wrote, Honor to the soldier and sailor everywhere who bravely bears his country's cause. Honor also to the citizen who cares for his brother in the field and serves as best he can the same cause. Honor to him, only less than to him who braves for the common good the storms of heaven and the storms of battle. As much as he loved being around soldiers, Lincoln despised the idea of having bodyguards, and he often tried to dismiss or evade those who were assigned to protect him. He ordered soldiers posted at the entrance gates to the White House to be dismissed. Despite this aversion, wiser heads prevailed, especially during the daily commute Lincoln made to the soldier's home a few miles away from the White House, where uh, this cottage on the grounds of the soldier's home was a getaway where Lincoln could go uh, to be away from the mayhem at the White House. An Ohio cavalryman, uh, an Ohio cavalry company, the Union Light Guard, was detailed to escort him, and two companies of the 150th Pennsylvania Infantry, the Bucktails, were assigned to protect him. Despite, and this is a picture of the uh, a drawing watercolor of the soldier's home, <clears throat> despite his dislike of the presence and necessity of the guard details, Lincoln couldn't help himself in showing a personal liking and interest in those assigned to the duty. In a letter of November 1st, 1862, Lincoln wrote, Captain Derrickson, with his company, has been for some time keeping guard at my residence, now at the soldier's retreat. He and his company are very agreeable to me, and while it is deemed proper for any guard to remain, none would be more satisfactory to me than Captain Derrickson and his company. Let's talk about light duty. Nice to have the president's approval. Sergeant Smith Stimmel, one of the Ohioans, recalled, often during the early part of the evening, after he had had his evening meal, Lincoln would take a stroll along the edge of the grove where our tents were pitched and have a little chat with the lieutenant in command, and sometimes he would look into the men's tents and, a, and have a passing word with them, asking them if they were comfortably fixed or something of that kind. We always felt that the president took a personal interest in us. He never spoke absent-mindedly, but talked to the men as if he were thinking of them. We soon appreciated this situation, another man wrote, and when we had been ill-treated, we used to make a point to talk the matter over in loud terms. Lincoln would often inquire about the problem and on occasion try to remedy it. Through incidents like this, the soldiers felt as if Lincoln was their friend. And also like little kids, they were trying to pull one over on Papa Abraham. In the autumn of 1862, Lincoln traveled to Sharpsburg, Maryland to meet with General McClellan in the wake of the Battle of Antietam. While there, he reviewed the troops and took time to speak to them. One member of the Iron Brigade described one of these events. Our battle flags were tattered, our, clo our clothing worn, and our appearance that of men who had been through the most trying service. Mr. Lincoln was manifestly touched at the worn appearance of our men, and he himself looked serious and careworn. He bowed low in response to the salute of our tattered flags. Another soldier wrote, his beard unshaven gave him a rough camp look. 
Altogether, he is the man to suit the soldiers. Lincoln always spoke to the soldiers on equal terms and eagerly sought out their opinions and concerns. Soldiers regarded him as their protector. In the depressing weeks between Antietam and the Battle of Fredericksburg, Charles Hayden of the 2nd Michigan Infantry wrote, no one seems to have any heart for the war except Lincoln, some of the lower officers, and the privates. On October 4th, the men of, of 62, the men of the 24th Michigan lined up in the Monocacy Valley to see the train from Antietam going back to Washington. When they observed the president on the rear platform of the train, they gave him a standing ovation as the train passed. Many soldiers would write of their efforts to catch a glimpse of the president or remarked on his frequent visits to their camps or dress parades. The president was a very real part of their existence and his frequent personal interactions with them made him genuine. They bonded with him on an emotional level. They knew that they mattered to him. This was not sparked by a single incident, but by the personality of the president. He was so devoted to the soldiers that he won their affection despite having different political views with many of them. His concerns and manner in dealing with the soldiers could not be faked. He is often referred to by the soldiers in their correspondence as Uncle Abe, Honest Abe, or even Father Abraham. Lincoln was sincere, caring, fair, but stern, like a good father. The nickname Father Abraham was already common by mid-1862. After McClellan's failure on the peninsula, Lincoln called for an additional 300,000 volunteers. Songwriter James Sloan Gibbon was inspired to write an inspirational call to arms, which was set to music by Patrick Sarsfield Gilmore, the bandmaster of the Union armies. The song, We Are Coming, Father Abraham, quickly became a top 10 hit. And the, the verse, the, the common verse is, we are coming, coming, our union to restore. We are coming, Father Abraham, 300,000 more. I, I spared you my song voice. Lincoln had become a symbol of the strength of the union to both civilians and the military because of his iron determination to preserve the Union, as well as his forgiving and merciful nature. Each call for additional troops came at a political as well as a human cost. The President was aware of and appalled by the human toll of the war. Battle after battle ended with horrific casualty rates, but with no clear indication that ultimate victory was within grasp. During his presidency, President Lincoln did whatever he could to minimize that cost in any way possible. He experimented with new weapons, seeking a military advantage to give his soldiers a tactical edge in combat. And this painting hangs in the Illinois National Guard Museum in Springfield. Uh, this is on the occasion when uh, William Spencer came to the White House to try to sell the Spencer rifle. And the target board on the right there, oh, it works. These are the shots Lincoln put into that board across the White House lawn. So that target board and this painting uh, are in the uh, National Guard Museum in Springfield, Illinois. And as serendipity would have it, I happened to stumble into the National Guard Museum that day when I was in Springfield when they were dedicating this painting, presenting it to the museum. So sometimes, sometimes it pays to be in the right place at the right time. Believing that the war should be fought to conclusion by applying maximum force, Lincoln managed a succession of generals until he found some who shared his vision. He schooled himself on military strategy, trying to understand the military science so as to be able to speak cogently with his generals. When Confederate authorities refused to recognize the legitimacy of the United States colored troops and threatened not to treat those captured as prisoners of war, Lincoln protected the troops by suspending the prisoner exchange cartel and threatening to retaliate for any executions to uh, POWs. On matters of morale and discipline, Lincoln showed mercy wherever he possibly could. <clears throat> 
He despised the constant stream of orders for execution for desertions and other crimes that came across his desk on a daily basis. He would look for any excuse he could find to commute a death sentence to one of those who were condemned. Lincoln set aside one half day per week in which anyone could have an audience with him to seek his intervention in a case where they believed mercy was due or an injustice had been committed. He annoyed his attorney general, Edward Bates, with his many reversals of court-martial convictions, especially for desertions. On one occasion, Lincoln stated, the way to have good soldiers is to treat them rightly. A private soldier has as, right, as much right to justice as a major general. During the war, more than 250,000 Union soldiers deserted. Rather than bringing them all to trial and executing the ones who were convicted, Lincoln issued at least two general pardons and amnesties during the course of the war to encourage the deserters to return to duty, the only penalty, loss of pay during their absence. He believed that giving men a second chance would make them better soldiers and that it would generally improve army morale and increase their willingness to fight if they knew that someone understood them and could be forgiving. During his term as president, he was presented with more than 1,600 capital cases. Lincoln explained his philosophy of mercy to Attorney General Holt, who was curious as to why a soldier who unashamedly admitted his guilt was spared. Well, Judge, Lincoln said, I think I must, must put this with my leg cases. They are the cases you would call cowardice in the face of the enemy, but I call them my leg cases. I put it to you and leave it to you to decide for yourself. If Almighty God gives a man a pair of cowardly legs, how can he help their running away with him? In consideration of some soldiers who were coaxed to desert, he stated, must I shoot a simple-minded soldier boy who deserts while I must not touch a hair on the wily agitator who induces him to desert? I think that in such a case, the agitator and the, I, to silence the agitator and save the boy is not only constitutional, but withal a great mercy. During his presidency, only 276 soldiers who were condemned were actually executed. Lincoln even suggested to one senator to change the law calling for execution rather than constantly imploring him to commute a sentence. Get Congress to do its job? In yet another way, Lincoln showed his compassion for soldiers. He made a conscious effort to visit as many of the 21 military hospitals in Washington as often as possible and he made a point of visiting the sick and wounded whenever he was with an army in the field. He spent part of the day of 4th of July, 1862, riding with a train of wounded soldiers to a makeshift hospital at the soldier's home. And on Christmas Day that year, he visited Armory Square Hospital and shook the hand of every soldier uh, who was being housed there. Countless soldiers interacted with the president, including some captured Confederate soldiers. Lincoln especially made a point of speaking to them. Lincoln gave each soldier he spoke with personal time regardless of the horrific injuries some of them had sustained. During his visit to Grant's army at Petersburg in 1865, Lincoln spent most of a day visiting and shaking hands with more than 2,000 soldiers who were in the hospitals around City Point. These visits gratified the soldiers and forged an unbreakable bond between them. In addition to visiting the soldiers, Lincoln tried to give some assistance to families stricken by personal loss. He encouraged his staff to secure government positions for many soldiers who were discharged from the army for injury or disability. Lincoln also displayed his gratitude and reverence for the dead of the war. During his many long stays at the soldier's home in Washington, he lived with the army and frequently strolled through the soldiers' cemetery there. He was never far from stark awareness of the cost of the war. Lincoln saw the consequences of his decisions firsthand every time he interacted with the veterans, who were also his neighbors. 
Lincoln could literally watch out his back window as the soldiers he had put into battle were buried in the cemetery in his backyard. There were sometimes as many as 40 burials per day. Many observers saw that he was visibly moved on these occasions. It's altogether fitting and proper that Lincoln was called upon to dedicate the Soldiers National Cemetery at Gettysburg in November of 1863. He truly felt the human cost of the battle and he sincerely meant the words he delivered on that occasion. Lincoln succeeded in implanting a meaning to the immense sacrifice of life, not just the ground that held them. One can imagine the feeling in these carefully chosen words, and this is, we all know these words, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. Honoring the fallen, giving a higher meaning to their deaths, was the ultimate gift he could bestow. Later, Lincoln would remark, quote, when I left Springfield to become president, I asked the people to pray for me. I was not a Christian. When I buried my son, the severest trial of my life, I was not a Christian. But when I went to Gettysburg and saw the graves of thousands of our soldiers, I then and there consecrated myself to Christ. Lincoln expressed his regard and gratitude for the soldiers on many occasions. At a fundraising fair for the soldiers' benefit in March of 1864, <clears throat> in a speech he stated, Ladies and gentlemen, I appear to say but a word. This extraordinary war in which we are engaged falls heavily upon all classes of people, but the most heavily upon the soldier. For it has been said, all that a man hath he will give for his life, and while all contribute of their substance, the soldier puts his life at stake and often yields it up in his country's cause. The highest merit, then, is due the soldier. In this extraordinary war, extraordinary developments have manifested themselves such as have not been seen in former wars. And among these manifestations, nothing has been more remarkable than these fairs for the relief of suffering soldiers and their families. And the chief agents in these fairs are the women of America. Lincoln made a habit to address regiments that were either first coming into service or that were leaving service. In a speech to the 166th Ohio Regiment as they were repair, uh, preparing to muster out of service in 1864, Lincoln said, I suppose you are going home to see your family and friends. For the service you have done in this great struggle in which we are engaged. I present you sincere thanks for myself and the country. I almost always feel inclined when I happen to say anything to soldiers to impress upon them the importance of success in this contest. It is not merely today, but for all time to come that we should perpetuate for our children's children this great and free government. I beg you to remember this, not merely for my sake, but for yours. It is in order that each of you may, through this free government which we have enjoyed, an open field and fair chance for your industry, enterprise, and intelligence, that you may all have equal privileges in the race of life with all its desirable human aspirations. It is for this the struggle should be maintained, that we may not lose our birthright, not only for one, but for two or three years. The nation is worth fighting for to secure such an inestimable jewel. Nine days later, he bid adieu to the 148th Ohio. I am happy to meet you here on this occasion, he said. I understand that it has been your honorable privilege to stand for a brief period in the defense of your country, and now you are on your way to your homes. I congratulate you and those who are waiting to bid you welcome home from the war, and permit me, in the name of the people, to thank you for the part you have taken in this struggle for the life of the nation. You are the soldiers of the Republic, everywhere honored and respected. I admonish you 
not to be turned from your stern purpose of defending your beloved country and its free institutions, but stand fast to the Union and the old flag. Soldiers, I bid you Godspeed to your homes. People don't talk that way anymore. Lincoln did not believe he would be reelected to the presidency in 1864. War weariness and some residual resentment over the Emancipation Proclamation threatened his continued leadership. His antagonist was none other than George B. McClellan, believed to be a favorite with the soldiers. McClellan was nominated on a peace platform, while it was obvious that Lincoln intended to see the war through to a successful conclusion. The soldier vote would be a barometer on the willingness of the army to fight on, but also of Lincoln's policies and vision. The president did what he could to encourage generals to allow soldiers to be furloughed home to vote. Many states did not allow absentee ballots. Others were allowed to vote in the field. But by 1864, Lincoln had resonated with the soldiers, whereas the lackluster McClellan had, the, the luster that McClellan had enjoyed early on was considerably tarnished by this point. Too much had happened, too many had fallen for the soldiers to identify with the failed general. The armies were now Lincoln's men, and they proved it with overwhelming support in the elections. The soldiers did not want their many sacrifices to be in vain. According to one soldier, to elect McClellan would be to undo all we have done in the past four years. Old Abe is slow but sure. He will accept nothing but unconditional surrender. Another lifelong Democrat wrote, I had rather stay out here a lifetime in the Army, much as I dislike it, than consent to a division of our country. We all want peace, but none want any but an honorable one. Lincoln won the election, having carried 75% of the soldiers' vote, compared to 55% of the civilian vote. Shortly after the election of 1864, Lincoln addressed one of the new regiments. <clears throat> soldiers, I am exceedingly obliged to you for this mark of respect. It is said that we have the best government the world ever knew, and I am glad to meet you, the supporters of that government. To you who render the hardest work in its support should be given the greatest credit. Others who are connected with it and who occupy high positions, their duties can be dispensed with, but we cannot get along without your continuing aid. While others differ with the administration, and perhaps honestly, the soldiers generally have sustained it. If they have not only fought right, but as far as could be judged from their actions, they have voted right. And I, for one, thank you for it. I know you are en route to the front, and therefore do not expect me to detain you long, and will therefore bid you a good morning. <clears throat> There's yet another significant way that Lincoln forged his bond with the soldiers. He is the only sitting president of the United States to lead troops into battle and to come under fire on the battlefield with them. And this happened several times during the Civil War. In May of 1862, during a visit to the Army of the Potomac on the peninsula, Lincoln became exasperated by the ineffectiveness and unwillingness of some of his generals to prosecute the war aggressively. General McClellan was, quote, too busy to meet with the president. So Lincoln, Secretary of War Stanton, and others set off on their own. Between May 5th and 12th, Lincoln conducted his own campaign. He reconnoitered the area of Hampton Roads, commandeered naval vessels and infantry forces, and drafted a plan of action that resulted in the capture of Norfolk, Portsmouth, the Gosport Navy Yard, the naval bombardment of a Confederate fort, and the destruction of the dreaded ironclad CSS Virginia, which had wreaked havoc on the US, U.S. naval forces just two months previously. This is the only instance of a sitting president engaging in active warfare in our history. Another well-known and well-documented instance <clears throat> occurred during the summer of 1864 when Jubal Anderson Early led his Confederate forces uh, down the Shenandoah Valley uh, toward Monocacy and then to the defenses of Washington. 
President Lincoln was present in Fort Stevens as the Confederates mounted a, a forceful attack against the fortification. He was standing on the ramparts as, as incoming fire was taken, and after an officer standing nearby him was struck in the head and killed, Lincoln was ordered off the wall by the commanding officer and reluctantly did so. During the last campaign of the war in March of 1865, Lincoln visited the army at Petersburg and City Point. He witnessed the Confederate assault on Fort Stevens, one of the last Confederate attacks of the war, and also witnessed the fighting against uh, the Union Fifth Corps under General Warren on the White Oak Road. Lincoln mingled with the troops who were waiting in reserve while sporadic fighting was still going on along the lines. And on April 2nd, when the Confederate forces had evacuated Richmond, Virginia, the President and a small force of infantry and Marines toured the conf captured Confederate capital. Despite the anxiety this caused to some senior officers, the soldiers who witnessed Lincoln on these occasions were inspired with admiration at his fearlessness and leadership. Lincoln's re relationship with the soldiers has become legendary. It is often depicted in popular culture, in fiction, and in movies. This is natural. Lincoln was an esteemed president, but much more so after having been martyred. Martyrdom has a way of elevating a human being to superstardom, uh, probably a credit they don't want. Lincoln was not as universally loved before the fatal bullet struck him as he was after, perhaps because the true value of the man was realized only after his loss. But his very real qualities are displayed often in fact. It should be no surprise that these were magnified if not exaggerated in our popular culture. Following, I'll give you several examples of this. The Perfect Tribute, this little book uh, pictured here, written by Mary Raymond Shipman Andrews, her name is longer than the text of the book, uh, in 1906. The story revolves around President Lincoln delivering the Gettysburg Address and the aftermath of that. A, a, a downcast Lincoln who believes the speech had been an utter failure uh, because it was received without accolade, is uplifted after speaking to a wounded Confederate soldier who doesn't know who Lincoln is and who praises the speech and its deeper meanings. One story uh, has a basis in historical fact, and that's <clears throat> the story of Private William Scott of Company K, 3rd Vermont Infantry. In the early days of the war, uh, in July, right after the bat first Battle of Bull Run, Scott was assigned guard duty and was caught sleeping while on duty. A court-martial sentenced him to death by firing squad four days after his conviction. Scott's comrades-in-arms petitioned uh, for clemency, and Lincoln intervened and pardoned Scott. That's all true. The young soldier later was killed in action the following spring during the Peninsula Campaign on April 16th, at Lee's Mill or Warwick Creek. The incident inspired the tale which dramatizes the pardon and glorifies the death and redemption of Scott and was first memorialized by the poem The Sleeping Sentinel by Francis de Hayes Janvier in 1862. And it was read publicly by James Murdoch on January 19, 1863 in the Senate chamber with President Lincoln in the audience. So he got to hear himself in poem. The story was told and retold in various forms over the years with varying degrees of veracity, but the story lived on for the most part because it truly depicted Lincoln's active regard for the fighting men in his armies. So we have seen Lincoln portrayed in our popular culture uh, in movies, pictured here, various uh, actors portraying Lincoln. In, uh, street names, park names, bank names, insurance companies, and, and many other manifestations. Lincoln is with us forever. Uh, let's take, take a look in your wallet. In the film Lincoln, the president spends several minutes discussing the war with two United States colored soldiers and then two white soldiers, one of whom recites the Gettysburg Address. The other white soldier and one of the black soldiers complete the recitation. 
While the scene is ahistoric and a bit overblown, the premise for it is not. Lincoln actually enjoyed spending time with the soldiers fighting the war. His sense of humor and candor and genuine concern moved many a, a man as recorded in their letters and diaries, not just in the wistful memoirs of what might have happened. It is doubtful if he would have encountered four such motivated and opinionated soldiers as the movie depicted, but they are artistically licensed representatives of real life. The welfare of the soldiers was always a priority with President Lincoln. In his second inaugural address on March 4, 1865, when victory was all but won, he spoke to this concern. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace with oursel among ourselves and with all nations. Lincoln's assassination was a severe blow to the army. Thousands of soldiers recorded the news in their letters and diaries. James K. Newton, uh, a school teacher from DePere who joined the 14th Wisconsin Infantry wrote, his death is felt to be a great national calamity, but nowhere is such sincere sorrow felt as here in the army. No man, not even Grant himself, possesses the entire love of the army as did President Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was never a general. He steered the country through the crisis of our Civil War, and he was re-elected to the presidency in the middle of it. One of the elements of that re-election is the overwhelming support of the soldiers who voted for him, even though they knew it meant continuing the war till the end, even though it meant they might be signing their own death warrants by so doing. That was possible because the soldiers had come to the conclusion that Abraham Lincoln was looking out for them and valued the cause they were fighting for. Regardless of whether the soldier vote was a decisive factor in the election, it is undeniably a testament to the bond between Lincoln and his soldiers. Lincoln never came to regard the army as a mere machine, never forgot the individual men who made it up. From the outset, he was the personal friend of every soldier he sent to the front, and somehow every man seemed to know it. Thank you. Questions? Yes, sir. Yes, in the same unit. So a total of three months. Give somebody else a turn. <laughs> I mean, that's the way he was. That when he went to Congress, he went for one term because they had their deal that I'll go this time, you go next time. He never went back. But it, it, there, it does seem that it did give him a sense of what it was like. Not, obviously, three months in the Black Hawk War isn't the same as three hours in the Civil War, probably. But, but still, to have that in your back pocket when you're looking out for those guys or sending them somewhere, uh, you kind of know what to do. And you'll see that with some, some general officers in the Civil War. When, when Joe Hooker was commanding the Army of the Potomac, the soldiers loved him because he looked after everything. The commissary always had cigarettes and newspapers and, and other things for their comfort and, and, and uh, leisure time. They despised Meade because Meade didn't care about their comforts. Lincoln cared about the comforts of his men and he made sure that if they were going to die, he wanted it to mean something, not just to be cannon fodder. Other questions? Yes, sir. I think it was over the course of time. It didn't happen overnight. There was no one, no one single incident. But it was in, in seeing, I mean, 
Soldiers usually either love or hate their immediate commander, right? But if you read the grumblings, the, the hate probably supersedes the love in many instances. And, and as a policeman, I didn't esteem too many of my commanders and wasn't sorry to see them go. But if the people that were ultimately in charge were looking out for my well-being, I knew it. And if they didn't, I really knew it. And the soldiers knew that too, I think. When, when people were, were relieved, the soldiers didn't like fighting and losing. When, when they lost, when they uh, retreated after the Battle of Chancellorsville, they were furious. When they retreated after the Battle of Fredericksburg, they were furious. Because they felt that their generals, they knew that they had fought their, their hearts out, but their generals had lost. Troops never loved Grant. Because that's right, but they didn't blame Lincoln for their deaths. They blamed poor generalship for their deaths, and which is why removing poor generals raised Lincoln's stock in their in their portfolios, if you will. Uh, here's somebody, and, and their personal interactions with him. He didn't. Ju they didn't just say, "Oh, here's the president," and go, "Yeah, yeah, I'm busy." Lincoln would. You know, who are you? Where are you from? Oh, really? And he would, he would talk, not at them, he would talk to them. He would interact on a human level, not just, I'm the boss and you're the private so-and-so. And, 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 and that carried. I mean, even to this day, uh, a member of this round table was revered because his father had shook, shook Lincoln's hand. And tell me that every soldier in every hospital or in every battlefield who made a personal visit to the White House and had a conversation with Lincoln that the ripple effects of that didn't carry everywhere, thousands and thousands of times. That doesn't happen anymore. That's probably one of the few times it, it ever did on such a scale with such large armies. Uh, and, and again, you didn't have to like Lincoln if you were a soldier. You probably a lot of them wanted to desert uh, over some of his policies. But there was something about him that, that they could connect with. We don't, we don't have, we don't have a, a Father Bush or a Father Clinton or a Father Obama, but we had a Father Lincoln, Father Abraham. How many people in the Army called one, their president uh, Father when they, in, during their tour of service? <laughs> okay, any more? Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> and, uh, and we're going to award you our Certificate of Honor by order of the General Staff for the Civil Law Roundtable of Milwaukee. This is an award is presented to Rob Girardi for furthering our understanding of the causes and consequences of the American Civil War, the watershed event in our nation's history. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for coming out to see me here today in these circumstances.